Hello, Angela Stanton. I am so, so, so honored to have you here. Would you briefly just introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and what you're passionate about? Sure. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for inviting me, first of all. Yes. Um, uh, in terms of who I am, I'm just a person just like everyone else, but I've been a migraine sufferer from a very young age, somewhere in my teens, but it was not yet called a migraine yet. It was more along the lines of cyclical vomiting syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. So that's how it started. And I've been a migraine all my life. I'm, I have several degrees in education. The last one is a PhD. And so I'm in science and research. And um the, the way the reason I know you is because of my research in migraine. And um, so I started my research in migraine, I would say about 15, 20 years ago, something like that by now, because this time is going. And uh, the migraine group on Facebook is eight, over eight years old. So I kind of tend to forget that. But yeah. so for a long time, I've been doing the research and I experimented on me because I, <clears throat> I reached a time when I didn't have a day without migraine. Basically, I had to quit my academic job. I used to teach at a university. I was a professor. Wow. I, had, I remember just being curled up, you know, on two chairs between classes because of my migraine and if the tryptan was working or not working or whatever other medication I was taking. And um, so I just quit and I said, okay, that's it. I got to figure out what this is because I can't live. <laughs> There's just no life. And um, so that's how I started. And that's how we get to know each other. Wow, that's incredible. How long were you a professor at a university before you started all of this? Oh, I, those are too long because I got my PhD too late in my life. I had other plans. I didn't actually want to get my PhD. I was in mathematics. Uh, I was getting my, uh, first of all, I had a family. So, and I'm coming from another country. I'm an immigrant. And so I first had to learn English, had to uh, work to make a living. I had no family to support me, just my husband. Wow. Uh, so coming up the stairs uh, of living and, uh, and earning, you know, at the end, having a house, having children. And <clears throat> once I had the house, once we had the children, once we sort of kind of settled down, then I said, okay, um, to inspire my kids to educate themselves, I have to remember back to school when I already wow. had the kids. And they were, um, I think my younger one was already um, 10. 10, something like that, nine or 10, when I went back to school. So I started and I started at junior college, college level because I had to start pretty much from the beginning. So I went to junior college, that's two years. And I went to UCLA and that was two years and got my degree in mathematics. But then I continued into graduate school. I was accepted to graduate of mathematics. But at, by that time, we had an earthquake and I lost my home. Oh, my goodness. Right. That was in the San Fernando Valley in 1994. So when we moved, we moved to Orange County and my commute became like I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and drive to UCLA. I got to the campus at 7 a.m. and I would sleep in the car until the classes started. I'm serious now. And then when the classes were finished, I would eat and do everything right there and then drive home and I would get home by about 8, 9 p.m. And so I didn't see the children. I didn't eat, didn't sleep. It was just horrible. So when the graduate school started and I was accepted in there, I was really happy. I really wanted to get my PhD in mathematics. I just loved the field. And they accepted me without application. It was fantastic. I was really, really been in that. But I said, you know, I'm commuting six to eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. not seeing my family and I need to quit and I need to move to a different university so then I went to UC Riverside which was closer to me at that time only 30 minutes drive and that was fantastic and then I got my master's of business administration because there was nothing I could just apply to and they invited me in there so I mm -hmm. took my master's of business administration when I finished then I said okay so now I'm gonna be able to earn a living and I was hired by Intel a year before I finished school to go up to Silicon Valley. So we're talking about moving to another city. But when I moved to that other city, my older son said, no, 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 no. You won't be accepted into Stanford. I said, well, I wasn't going to apply to Stanford, but now I have to apply to Stanford. <laughs> and so I got accepted into Stanford as well. Oh, my goodness. School. <laughs> So I got a second master's and that was in management science and engineering. So it was in the engineering school. It was very mathematical, very technical. And that's when I started to get curious about 
behavior because by that time I was a vice president at one of the credit card companies and I don't want to name which one, but I was a vice president and I saw that people were absolutely behaving clueless within corporations. And there were all kinds of firms all the time on, on the campus at this particular company, uh, basically um, helping you know business recommendations of what to do. And it seemed like the company was just not doing anything right. And I said, okay, something about the people the behavior, how, how do people make decisions? What, how come that they're told to go left and then they decide to go right? I mean, what makes people decide things? And so then I came back uh, when there were big layoffs um, in 2001 because of the 2000 uh, crash, 2001 crash. And so there were big layoffs everywhere. So I came back in 2002 uh, to home because I was laid off. As a vice president, I actually laid myself off. And um, applied to a PhD program that allowed me to create my own program, which was uh, decision making, uh, neuroscience, and economics combination. It was a very unusual thing. But by this time, I was in my um, I was in my fifties. I was early fifties. So we're talking about quite an age gap there. So when I graduated, I think actually I started late forties, and I graduated when I was fifty two, three, something like that. And so uh, I'm now almost 70. So many years have oh passed. You look, you look so good. I just have to interrupt <laughs> you to say, you look so amazing. You. That's incredible. Thank Please you. continue. And nothing compared to what I would have looked like before COVID when I lost half my hair, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, I know yeah. hair because I watched your videos on my hair. But so, so I was old already, old per se. Sure. Now. So I didn't teach too long because I Got started it. Eight, and also because there was no field for me to teach because my field was so specific. It included yeah. neuroscience, economics, and law, uh, you know, um, the constitutional law with respect to human rights and how it connects to your ownership of your body. And so it was a very unusual field and I couldn't teach that. So I was hired to teach economics, but I said, okay, well, I um, don't wanna teach economics. I wanna teach behavioral economics, neuroeconomics, neuroscience. And that was not in the cart, so I just quit. So I only taught at the university for, I would say about two years. And that, more than two, because I was teaching also while I was still a student. So like even when I was at Stanford, I was teaching at Berkeley. So can't say that I was teaching only two years, but approximately. And I, then I went to work at Max Planck Institute in um, Germany oh. as a fellow, as a research fellow for, and I was there for a few months. And then I came back and I said, it was just too much. Oh, I couldn't do anything with the migraines. And so that's when I started migraine research. So that goes back to about 2008, 2007, 2008 is when I started. Wow. I am already so intrigued. <laughs> I think that you are, you are the type of person that I would just define as a different breed. You sound like a very <laughs> hard worker. You sound very yeah. smart. I'm so impressed. When did you start having migraines? Oh, so I was about 10, like 10, 11, something like that. But because they were not migraines, I can't actually really truly recall. But I remember okay. having uh, cyclical vomiting syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. So I would get sick, typically in the summertime when you eat a lot of fruits and, sh and sweets and that kind of stuff. And I would always come down with this. I was always, you know, just told, oh, she's sick, she just ate something bad. But it didn't occur to me that these were migraines until in my Facebook group. I started to see mothers coming in asking if their children are having, you know, mm. the vomiting syndrome and they're also having uh, irritable bowel syndrome, but they also have headache. Now, I didn't, I don't remember if I had headaches or not, but these children do. And so when I started to go back in my life, I said, okay, so I probably had migraines in my early teens. I just don't know. Yeah. But the first real migraine that I, do know it was a migraine, which came with a headache and everything, the vomiting and all the other symptoms. That was when already I had my second child. So I was mm. 29, something like that. Okay. That is amazing. I just recently learned that you don't necessarily have to have headaches or yeah. migraines to be a migrainer. So could you describe what is the difference between someone who's a migrainer and someone who is not? Okay, so oh, somebody who's not a migrainer or doesn't have the pain with a migraine. So the difference here, because 
migraine itself is genetic. So if you have, if you're a migraineur, then your brain is different, period. That's so what I want to hear about. Yeah. Right. So it's not a headache at all. Uh, and so when you mentioned that to have migraines without a headache, absolutely. Uh, there are many people who have migraines without a headache. Uh, some of them, most of them, they'll show aura. So the aura is a visual mm -hmm. uh, sign that something is not right. <clears throat> Usually aura is defined in a very particular way if you look at literature. But what I find in my group, which is by now uh, close to 14,000 members in the main group and 2,000 in the, the other group, is that basically most everybody has some kind of visual uh, stimulation, but it, not stimulation, visual disturbances, but they aren't called aura. And, and so it is my, I have a hypothesis here, which is not part of my migraine work, but my hypothesis is, is that basically every single migraine comes with an aura. The question is whether the, the waves that create the aura, and I'm going to explain what that is in a minute, if the waves that create the aura come from an angle such that your occipital cortex, which is in the back of your brain, which is the one that basically translates all the messages that the eyes see, because the eyes only see little signals of black and white, or even if it's color, it's electrical signals. So when I'm looking at you, I only see electrical signals from it. And it's the occipital cortex that then creates the image that it thinks I'm looking at. And whether I'm looking at that or not, it has no idea because what it sees is a, a reflection of this electrical signal on the cortex. And so it's going to understand that and create a picture that it thinks I'm familiar with. Now, in terms of the aura, um, there is what is called a cortical spreading depression. So this is a very complicated concept, but so we're all familiar with seizure, right? Epileptic seizures. So we yeah. know that people then end up with all kinds of symptoms often shaking hands and body and everything. And so what happens in a case of a seizure is basically um, an electrical explosion inside the brain. So inside the brain, you have the neurons, the, the nerve cells that communicate via electricity. So this electricity is moving through every single nerve cell. And in the case of a seizure, there is one point where it starts, but it doesn't have a place to go. So the electricity, it just sort of explodes and goes everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. In the case of migraine, the cortical spreading depression is very similar, but instead of exploding in one place and going everywhere, it starts at a very particular part of the brain and then slowly moves through covering the entire one hemisphere where the migraine region is of the brain. And as it goes through, it activates every single neuron as it passes. And your brain can see that activation depending upon what angle the activation is happening. And so if it's happening for those who typically have aura migraines, then they see this activation. And so the moving lines represent how the, each neuron is being touched. And so this is a depolarization of the whole brain. It's an ionic shift. And an ion is say salt, everybody is familiar with salt. Salt is basically a molecule of combination of two atoms. One is sodium and the other is chloride. And if you separate them because they are att attracted to each other and, and they charge and then a salt, as a salt itself, you can pick up a molecule or a salt, a crystal, which is many molecules and it won't hurt you because there's no electrical charge in it. It's pretty balanced out the sodium and potassium, oh, sodium and chloride, sorry, if I said potassium, it's sodium chloride uh, tied together really strongly. But when you're talking about an ion that is just a sodium or it's just a chloride, and so it's not connected to anything and it has an electrical charge. And in this case, it's the sodium. So the sodium moves through the brain and it's called a depolarization because of what happens to the electrical level that is increasing or decreasing, it's going to be a depolarization. And so in this case, the electricity, the voltage itself is, becomes more positive. And that's because sodium is a positively charged ion. And so it has inside the neuron and creates what's called an action potential. And so the action potential is how the, the neuron is then activating the electricity that then goes the, sends the message to the next neuron. And so this is the activation. So at one point, the sodium is pushed into the neuron and then it goes through the whole brain in that one hemisphere. And as it goes through, for the aura migraineurs, they can visualize it as 
either colorful, typically colorful, but they can also be just black and white zigzag lines. But even those who don't have aura migraines may see visual disturbances. Like I always see visual disturbance. It may be that I will have little gray spots. Usually this eye is the one that is affected for me. And so it's the left side of my brain that has a migraine. That this side uh, in my eye, I can see like little gray spots. It's not floaters because the floaters is when you blank, it's going to change position. Sure. A blind spot doesn't change position. It's just whatever you do, it's just going to follow you. And you can have more, and more blind spot or you can have like a fireworks. Those are beautiful. When I get an order like that, I call oh, you wow. you have fireworks coming to where you close your eyes because it's inside your brain. So you don't have to have your eyes open, right? So you close your eyes. And then oftentimes, most often I see them blue. And so they're blue coming toward my uh, my face. It's just beautiful. Uh, sometimes like a middle of the night, you're hit with like a flashlight suddenly hitting, uh, like almost like somebody's shown a flashlight into your eye, but it's coming from the back. That too is a visual disturbance. Some people see what's called the snowing, that it's mm -hmm. like little white uh, snowflakes falling down and interfere with their vision. Some people have Alice in Wonderland, like they may see people looking with huge ears or face parts will, the eyes will be here, the ears over there. So very unusual. I often see, for example, uh, fog, which is really funny. Like I would sit in the room and suddenly everything looks kind of foggy. Wow. And so, so these are the all visual disturbances in aura. And so if you have an aura like this or visual disturbance, this is a very strong signal for you that something is happening. And you can make changes in your life. And so an aura migrainer um, that doesn't have a headache at the end means that this depolarization of the brain ended up repairing the problem that would have caused the, the migraine. So the whole reason oh. that this was happening is to find that region that had the problem. And this problem is not enough salt. And we will talk about that a lot. And um, because it's a depolarization, what it does, it sends the sodium all the way through. And so it can refill the sodium depletion in that particular place. And then mm. you don't get the headache part of it at all. So it depends on um, how much uh, salt there or sodium is in the particular part of your brain and how it is able to distribute this sodium via this cortical spreading depression that you may or may not get a headache. Wow, that is incredible. How did you even begin to figure this out? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is what took me the longest time because if you look at, I read all the academic articles, of course, I read all the books, but neither, not, none of these two systems would tell me the mechanism connected. So there would be a lot of academic articles, for example, the cortical spending depression, but every, every single academic article on cortical spreading depression is exclusively on aura migraine. Then you have the regular migraine is unexplained. Then you have articles, for example, in physics discussing the electrical elements of the brain. And there are some articles that go in there looking at migraineurs, looking to see is the electricity the same in amplitude and magnitude in a migraine brain as it is in other brains. Then there will be some other biochemistry articles that will go into the neurotransmitters and will say, well, the migraine brain seems to have more neuronal connections in the sensory organs. And so, but they say nothing more, that, that's all they say. So then as you come years and years and years and understanding that the kind of doctorate that I have, which is in neuroscience and in economics and in decision-making and Mathematics is a big phase in understanding how this whole thing may work together and how you can put it together. Then you can say, oh, if the migraine brain has more connections between the neurons, and by the way, I'm also certified in a functional magnetic resonance imaging, which very specifically looks at how the neurons yeah. work, right? And so once you understand that, okay, so if I have more neuron, neurons that are connected, then I will have more chatter between those neurons because I have more connections. And if I have more connections and more chatter, well, that will need more sodium. Well, if mm -hmm. I need more sodium and this cortical spreading depression is a depolarization, well, then it must be connected to the fact that maybe some places are out of sodium. I mean, 
you kind of sort of roll with the punches as you discover the process. Yeah. And it, stay, it takes years and years and years. To yeah. Understand it. Yeah, that's incredible. I can, uh, I like your phrasing roll with the punches because that's how I acquired the knowledge that I have. I did go to school, but most of my knowledge that I use for my clients is just from experience. Oh yeah. I was so in the trenches. Has, yeah, everyone yeah. I think. I think in school you just learn how to think. You don't actually learn exactly that much, but you learn how to think at least yes. many of us. And that's the goal. That yeah, well said. I wanna ask you about your approach on higher protein. So I know in your group, you definitely recommend higher protein than even I recommend. And I consider myself a high protein recommender. I usually <laughs> recommend one gram of protein per pound of desired body weight, which I think is sufficient, but you're recommending more than that, I believe. Right. Could you explain where you're coming from with that approach? Yes, I do. So um, there are two steps to this, at least to me. It might become more as you go on. But <laughs> one, one of the steps is that we need to understand is that migraineurs are carbohydrates intolerant. And because of this, nearly all, I would say about 99% of the migraineurs who come into the group and when they run the tests that I ask them to run, then we can see that they all are metabolically compromised. And um, metabolic compromise is many different phases and people call it insulin resistance, type two diabetes, hypoglycemia, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's all, all the same. same things. Exactly. It's just a, perhaps a different stage, but they're all the same thing. And so what I'm trying to do is because this metabolic, um, this arrangement of, of the different organs in the liver, um, there are certain things that don't work real well, particularly for migraineurs. So when you, for example, have uh, some metabolic disease. One of the most first steps, for example, for most people that they discover that something is wrong is that they're getting sugar crashes. So they end up shaky and all. Um, but when I'm looking at, you know, migraineurs, this does happen, but it's not that often. Most, most often they appear completely healthy. So they have no sign whatsoever. The way that I discover that they have a metabolic problem the most often is that I can find from this particular test that I do that they release two hormones at the same time that should not ever happen, which is the insulin and the glucagon. And so when oh they release, goodness. yeah, wow. so when you release both at the same time, then that hints at a complete uh, problem with your metabolic system. And so that means that no matter what they eat, they may end up releasing glycogen because glucagon is released. And so glucagon initiates a release of glycogen and the release of ketones via the, the liver, but insulin is also alive, which then takes all that glucose out of the blood and causes a sugar crash. And so what I see is a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger sugar level, glucose level, even when they aren't eating at all. Yeah. And so this would tell me that there is a problem with the system. And because they keep on increasing the glucose because of the, the dysregulated system, we need to regulate the system. And so one way you regulate the system is by overloading it with glucose without eating glucose. And so when you eat protein, uh, about 80% of the amino acids, which are the, the proteins that um, are made of, so 80% of the amino acids are glucogenic. Yeah. Now, if you eat just the amount of protein, like for example, you eat one gram per, I guess it's per, is it per pound or per kilogram? Per pound. Per pound, okay. So one gram per, per, per pound, um, it's probably perfect for you because it will give you enough leucine. So the leucine is very important here. Leucine yes. is a key amino acid. It's a bench chain amino acid that initiates uh, protein synthesis. Yeah. When you start protein synthesis, you will spike insulin a little bit, but it's going to completely flatten your blood glucose and blood insulin levels because your body is busy synthesizing protein. Mm -hmm. If you eat too little, uh, um, protein though, you can't start protein synthesis. So 80% of the amino acids will turn to glucose. And if you eat too oh. much, the same thing with the excess. So there is going to be a range at begin which you start protein synthesis. So if you eat more leucine than say, if, if for, you're, you're very young, so it's going to be about three grams. For my age, it's going to be more like four, four and a half gram. Uh, because it gets more as we get older. So we actually need to eat more protein as we get older, which is quite counterintuitive. 
uh, exercise reduces this a little bit. But so it's not just how, when you start protein synthesis with your leucine, but your body's ability to continue to synthesize. So if you come from the standard American diet, the said that right. your body isn't used to synthesizing protein at all. Yeah. And so you will need a very high level of leucine. And so if I give you, tell you to eat two grams of protein for, per, per your uh, weight, then it's going to give you more leucine. There's a better chance that you can start protein synthesis. But of course, you will exceed your protein synthesis ability. So there will be extra protein. And that extra protein is going to convert to glucose. But there's a difference between the glucose conversion when it's extra protein or even when it's lower amount of protein versus eating carbohydrates. Yeah. Because the protein conversion to uh, glucose in the amino, the glucogenic amino acids conversion to glucose is based on demand. Whereas if you eat carbohydrates, it's just immediately so converted. But if you eat too little, uh, too little protein, like if I get somebody who has type two diabetes, very strong diabetes and very strong dysregulation of the glucagon and insulin system. So the pancreas is completely messed up. It doesn't just do one thing at a time. If that person gets too little protein, to start protein synthesis and all of it converts to glucose, then after a while, that person is gonna crash. Yeah. And so it's much better for them to eat a higher protein and a lower fat. And I don't want them to be in ketosis at that stage either, partly because they still have migraines and ketosis is a fantastic state, but it's not necessary for a migraine. And also because if they are on medications, there may be interactions. And so, I encourage a carnivore diet and I encourage a very high protein diet. Now, as they, you know, recover and everybody recovers, it can take as little as a week and it can take as long as three years. It depends on how much damage and how sensitive the body is and, and how easy for the body it is to, to recover. Uh, do you exercise? Do you have other health issues that first have to be worked through before your body can just reset and work? And so as, as you go on, um, you can reduce the protein in time. So many carnivores, many of the migraineurs who no longer have migraines and do really good have the right to reduce. They can go to enjoy my other group where we do keto carnivore, which is a lower okay. protein. So there is one-to-one -one protein and fat ratio. But I mm. find most migraineurs don't want to. They just <laughs> want to stay on the regular because they enjoy it. It becomes very simple, very easy to do. And, um, and many of them also stay on just a low carb, high fat. So not ketogenic, but low carb, high fat, because that too is maybe socially more acceptable, I guess, sure. uh, social friendly. And so very few of them go to the keto part um, of the yeah. spectrum. I think that I could be a migrainer because, I mean, I was first thinking that because I need about 10 grams of sodium per day to feel normal. If I underdo it, I either black out or I'm just dragging. And even my husband is like, this is not normal. <laughs> and it sounds like it is for people that you know. And then also with the high protein approach, I was ketogenic for 15 years before I switched to carnivore. And when I switched to carnivore, I just had to dive right in and eat more protein than I was used to. And right. that was one of the things that saved my life. My, I was having hypoglycemia. I remember being in the hospital and they would have to give me glucagon shots and nothing brought my blood sugar to be normal until I ate like four pounds of this shredded pork they had in the hospital. I was like, just give me meat. And I ate it and ate it. And my blood sugar stabilized at 85. And that's when I realized to stop this hypoglycemia, I just need protein. I don't need carbs. I don't need sugar to raise my blood sugar. I need protein because that's like, there's a safe boundary there. Like exactly. you said, the glucose from excess protein is not the same as carbs. And once I understood that and gave myself permission to even overeat it, it, it gave me so much freedom. I mean, I really attribute so much of my healing to being able to eat more protein than I felt comfortable eating before. Um, right. It sounds like I really could be a migrainer. I'm not sure, but everything you're saying resonates with my journey. And I, you know, I think it's so fascinating. I apply it to a lot of my clients if it, if it seems appropriate. Um, and like you said, 
there's a time and season for higher protein and you can go back down to regular moderate protein if you're healthy, but I thrive with high protein these days. I don't find myself wanting high fat again. Um, I try to moderate and then I want more protein. <laughs> but you, know, so, you don't have to, if it works for you, then don't change it, right? If it's yeah. not working, why break it? So, um, but also uh, some people are scared from protein because the current understanding, if you go back into what they call evidence-based medicine, which to me, there's no evidence and whatever. Um, <laughs> when you go back to that particular view and you talk to doctors, then they get really concerned about eating too much protein because they say you're going to destroy your kidneys. You're going to have very high uh, albumin, creatinine, whatever in your, your blood. And the funny thing is, is that this hasn't happened to anyone so far that I know. And if it did, it's because they have some kidney issues, which you're right. to fix and then it's going to repair. But there's also another fear. Uh, I have one person who's really funny, who I've been talking to. She's not a migraineur, at least not that I know of. But so she tells me, oh, she doesn't want to eat protein because it spikes insulin. And this is very important to understand that insulin is absolutely required for protein synthesis. So you want to spike yes. insulin. But then I have people elsewhere, like on, on Twitter, there's big arguments on that. Well, then you need carbohydrates. No, you don't, because that's why you have the glucogenic amino acids, because yeah. those spike insulin for mm -hmm. you. They behave like glucose. And then you so start key. to glucose and start working toward protein synthesis and provide the energy, maybe glucose energy toward protein synthesis, but that's a different function. That's not energy that you're going to be using for your exercise. Or, yeah. 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 You made a really beautiful differentiation there. And I, I hope that I might just clip that portion and repost just that, because I think that is so key for so many people. Insulin is not bad. We need not, not that thing at all. I mean, that if you don't live, right? That's type yes. of diabetes. And yes, so exactly. And yeah. I think want to also add to this also that insulin now has a function that it didn't originally have. So when we were ancestral humans, and you can go back as long as long time ago as you wish, I go back to 300,000 years, which was the last, the latest phase of our development. And we had an ice age. So we didn't really eat carbohydrates because from 300,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago, we had an ice age. There's not that many plants available, some, but very minimally. And most places around the world was under ice uh, all the time, all through the year. And so when you didn't have any carbohydrates, how come you had insulin? And it's not just that you do protein synthesis, but as a child, insulin is a growth hormone. Mm. So without insulin, uh, you can't take, for example, glucose out of the blood and deposit it to grow your bones, your muscles, your replace cells, the nerve cell. I mean, everything in our body is basically built from protein with the use of insulin. So that is a growth hormone. And it's supposed to be, by the time you're adults, it's supposed to sort of kind of taper down. That is its function. And it is just in the past uh, couple of thousand years that we started to increase our carbohydrates right. and we changed the role of insulin. And it's mm. only in the last, not even hundred years. I mean, when I was a child, we didn't eat carbohydrates like we eat today. And many of the, the fruits, for example, didn't exist yet. Like uh, nectarine was created when I was in my teens. It didn't exist before. We just had wow. peaches. And so they called it the hairless peach for a, a little while. <laughs> Before it so got funny. the nectarine. Wow. And so uh, these things didn't exist. And so our body was not used to having to eat carbohydrates. And so our insulin, even if I go back to my grandparents, even in their era, they ate some vegetables, but nothing like we do today. So it was not used uh, in the wrong way. In, according it was an to today. They, we are abusing it now. So now we have yeah. children who at age one, two have type two diabetes. And so this is no longer a normal way of being. Wow, that is such a good point. So insulin has gotten a bad rap because of right. the fact that we've abused it, but it's actually right. essential, necessary. It's very essential, right? I have also heard from my friend slash client who is in your group that you recommend taking magnesium in the morning instead of night. Right. Can you explain why? Right. Yes. So it came from the discovery that everybody, even all migraineurs actually, like my husband, who's not a migraineur, taking magnesium at night gives very vivid, uh, nightmarish kind of REM mm -hmm. sleep. And so 
migraines already are more alert than other people are. So we sort of are like the cats sleeping with an open eye because our sensory neurons are a lot, we have more connections and we have better hearing, we have better uh, smell sensors. We, we are always on alert. And because of this, now you have to understand the role of magnesium in the brain to understand this, but basically magnesium is essentially the one that is opening the ionic channels together with ATP. So we're talking about what's called the voltage dependent ionic channels. And they are opened from the inside of the cell uh, as an ATP molecule is attached to the opening. So the opening has to be done by energy and magnesium is the one that is taking the ATP there to connect mm. it. And so if you have, if you take magnesium at night, this channel is gonna open, 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 open. And you don't want it to open that often because that at night you want to sleep. And so for migraineurs, magnesium at night can cause disturbance. And so that's why we take them in the morning. And then mm -hmm. we may get to be hyper from it in the morning and that's okay. So it's, it's not a, a relaxing uh, element for migraineurs. Uh, I know that some people take it at night. Many people take it at night because it helps them sleep. Well, a migraineur taking it at night is guaranteed to not sleep. Wow. That's so fascinating. Also, what about iodine? I've heard that you don't recommend taking like Lugol's iodine. That's something that I've been taking for a while. I you know, I figured our soil is depleted of minerals. I'm not eating seafood every day. And I know that I need iodine. Why would you recommend against that? No, I don't. I recommend iodine. Okay. I just not oh. support. I don't support Lugol's because Lugol's is a synthetic product. And also because it comes in the form of drops, it's inaccurate. And if you're taking too large, uh -huh. or too small, you're not helping yourself. You need to be pretty good with how much iodine you take. And it's also better for iodine itself it's better for your body to not hit it with a large dose at once, but to take it in the kind of food. And so I recommend uh, to, that's the only plant-like substance basically, because I, I don't recommend plants, but kelp. Kelp. Very awesome. high in iodine. And so, awesome. okay. and, and of course I recommend everybody to eat iodized salt. So I eat iodized salt. Okay. But if I need to supplement iodine in addition to that, then I recommend, um, natural kelp either you can buy kelp and eat it or you can have the capsules that have the dried kelp yeah awesome okay i do consume freeze-dried kelp and it's quite delicious right. um Perfect. that's really really good to know that makes so much sense with lugals and i think that a lot of people are unsure how much they're actually getting with the drops i'm unsure i get a little right. nervous sometimes so that is awesome that's thank you for explaining that um, do you recommend any other supplements on a regular basis? I do. So we have, in addition to, of course, iodized salt, which we always take, everybody's taking that. <clears throat> I recommend three, <clears throat> excuse me, three additional supplements. Okay, okay. So one of them is magnesium, but as we discussed, uh, we are taking it in the morning and I recommend the magnesium kind. Now I make supplements, but I don't sell them. So I'm not financially connected to the company who's making them at all, but I initially made them for me. And then cool. this uh, company uh, decided to sell it to migraineurs and to other people, but awesome. I'm not connected financially to them. So I make a magnesium, I designed one that has four kind of elemental magnesiums in it, which are, I recommend that you look into that. The company is called Health by Principle, but it's not necessary. You can create your own, just buy the four kinds and take one pill from each and, and you're fine. And okay. this would be uh, magnesium citrate, malate, glycinate, and taurinate. Taurinate is sometimes taurine or taurate, whatever. Right. So these four are combined. Uh, so these are, this is recommended. Then I also recommend a very unusual kind of B1, which is thiamine. And that's not just for migraineurs, by the way, that's for everyone. So everybody okay. in my family is, and my husband's taking it too. So everybody in my family is recommended to take it because um, today everybody is thiamine deficient, primarily because our soil is the soil. Okay. And so we don't have enough thiamine. And then the animals that carry the thiamine, which are pork, pork is rich in thiamine. In the US, all the porks are injected with this stuff to reduce right. the fat. And so you don't want to eat that much of it and you don't get enough thiamine in the pork anymore. And um, we are not able to, even the pork itself of the pig doesn't get enough thiamine from whatever food it gets. So we are thiamine deficient also because we are on hormones, we drink alcohol, we drink tea, coffee, these kind of things These are all reduced thiamine. And thiamine is a very important function in the 
process of, of the mitochondria and creating ATP. And it is very powerful in the brain. And so most of the people who take this, this is a TTFD and it's a very long word, it's tetra, whatever, something. Okay. <laughs> it's a very long word. But basically the difference between this and the standard, which is hydro hydrochlorosite, I believe, is that uh, whereas the synthetic thiamine that you, that you take as a, a, a B1, a cheap B1 that you get everywhere, they come in bigger doses. So you can see that the smaller one, the smallest is like 400 milligrams, a very large dose. And the reason why it is so large, because the only we need is like one milligram a day. So it's mm -hmm. like a hundredfold minimum. It's because it can't get into the cells because it needs a transporter. Wow. Okay. So you can't just put a nutrient into a cell. It has to get in through a transporter or it has to be fat soluble uh, so that it moves through the, um, the cell membrane, which allows lipid things to go through. The TTFD kind, uh, B1, is fat soluble. And so it can go through without any uh, transporters. So the pill itself, the, the capsule or pill, they're like 50 milligrams. And so much bigger than what you otherwise take. And they have huge reactions. So some of the migraineurs, they, there's a, a capsule form, which is alithiamine. And there's a pill form, which is lipothiamine. It's this big made by the same company, although there's a different label on it, and it's Japanese, so they have an exclusive patent for it. And the the one, the lipothiamine, is a capsule, I'm sorry, it's a pill. And so I have migraineurs who break it into 10 pieces and take one little piece, so one-tenth of the pill, wow. and they get huge paradox from it. But what I find, they keep on taking it to working as a paradox, and in time, the paradox disappears. So I had a very big paradox. Most migraineurs have some neurological issues. Mine was anxiety, panic disorder. Gone within a couple of weeks of wow. starting B1. And so this was a huge change because if you read my book, part of migraine comes with anxiety. It, it started with the fight or flight. And so if you can reduce the fight or flight, then you reduce your migraines. It's just an automatic thing. And so I no longer have fight or flight. I can't even create one because I'm taking. Um, wow this supplement it's really amazing and it but it takes some time to get used to it because of the paradox and then the last one that i recommend for everyone is a b2 but again a b2 of an active form comes in riboflavin 5 phosphate that's the only active form and so you're going to see that all the other kind of b2s again come in very big doses doses this one is a small dose and this one a very small but that little small dose is plenty uh, to work. So uh, this one is available in many brands. Just look for the riboflavin 5-phosphate. Right. So they're the ones that everybody's taking. And these on their own make a huge difference already. Are, is there a list, list of your supplements that you created on your website or your Facebook group? Where would one find those? In the Facebook group, yes, because okay. this company is giving discount to the supplements that I've created. I've only created three, and I don't, I don't think that I'm going to create more. I created a, the electrolyte, which I have right here, which is the salt. Uh, so I don't take uh, salt because I get sick from it, actually. Taking salt directly causes, for some people, it's, it's an emetic, so it can make you vomit. And you can use it with children. If they ate something they shouldn't, you can give them salt, and they may throw up. So that's basically what it's used for. So I would throw up from taking salt. So I'm taking it in a capsule instead. So this is okay. iron salt. It's with iodine in a capsule and nothing else. Uh, there's a yeah, little bit of potassium in there instead of the um, uh, anti-caking agent. I'm using a little potassium, which does the same thing. And so this is the other one is the magnesium. And the last one is a D3 because I just was really frustrated. I needed D3 and not everybody does, but I needed D3. And I wanted to have one that was coming with MCT oil. And it mm. didn't have all this other kind of gunk in there. Yes. So and it came with magnesium, magnesium because D three requires magnesium to to settle in, uh, in the right place. Oh man, so, I'm gonna have to get these. <laughs> so I, I designed one, and also the caplet that it comes in. So it's with MCT oil, and um, it has magnesium as well as the D three in it, which is the natural D C from the lamb's um, uh, lanolin. So it's a real one taken from. Awesome. The and the caplet itself is made from gel capsule from a fish gel. So it's not like a gelatin capsule that then causes right. a bump or something. It's a fish gel. So it's soft and it dissolves really easily and it's useful for your body. So every part of it is edible. 
That's beautiful. I can think of so many clients who would benefit from that, who don't do well with electrolyte supplements, or even a lot of capsules out there will still have citric right. acid or yeah. just add things added to it. And then the MCT oil with the D3 supplement, you're just, I mean, I'm so excited because I've looked for that. It's, it's like, you can get time. a couple. Yeah, you can see one or two kinds, but then they put other stuff in there too, which I did. Right. And yeah. uh, so I wanted to design my own. So these were the three that I wanted. And uh, at one point I was thinking about designing more like B12 or B9, but there was, you know, not that many people. So everybody thinks that migraineurs have problem with the MTHFR genetic variant and they need B9 or B12, and that's not true. And so once I discovered that really truly, it, that's not true. Uh, I stopped trying to make the supplement because uh, there was no need for it. So. Mm. That's amazing. Your work has been so honest and um, I just really admire you for your Facebook support group is better. It's better support than people get anywhere. Like, and you're not asking it's free, correct? It's completely free. Yeah. And it's I do completely like free. Test analysis and other kind of things that, um, and actually many times that we have a lot of doctors in the group. And so I have awesome. a, oftentimes I get questions from doctors to help them analyze a blood test because by now I have grown such a habit. I probably analyze, I don't know, 5,000 blood tests, but by now. And so I'm analyzing a lot deeper than an average doctor would do because I don't just look at the ranges, top and bottom. Right. I actually look at the functions and I look at the connections to other kind of things. And it's all free. And um, yeah, I have probably about 30 medical doctors in the group by now. And some wow. will send their patients into the group or to me privately, whichever the case may be. That's incredible. And what is your book called? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's Fighting the Migraine Epidemic Complete Guide. Uh, okay. How to stop migraine, something like that. <laughs> okay. I'll get some yes. links for you to put in this description when I post this video. But I really would love every link you have for people to link up with you and your support and your supplements, because I I'm ready to try your supplements. Um, and you're changing lives. I, even just from my one client, I mean, we've been working together for a year and we've made a lot of progress. And it's funny because my initial recommendation was higher protein and it, you know, she just needed that. She just, you have more experience. You have more knowledge than I do. All I have is my experience. And so I'm still learning. And so you changed her life. You're changing so many lives. And I'm really grateful for that. So yeah, yeah. Um, it feels fantastic, by the way, just in, in my end to be able oh, to pass on what I've learned because I, done, I did the same thing as you do. Uh, I, it's my experience. And then I just pass it down and it seemed to have worked for other people. So it sort of kind of spread that way. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Angela. I really, really appreciate it. I hope to get to know you better and let me know if there's anything that I can do to help share your message. Well, thank you. Um, awesome. Just share the message. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Take thank care. You. you too. Thanks. Bye.